Blog Talk Radio. Radio brings you The Haunted Sea with host Scott Martis. Hello, this is Scott Martis. Welcome to another episode of The Haunted Sea. This is episode four of our Zuyo Maru Carcass review. And this is the final chapter. This is the Zuyo Maru going out of business sale. Joining me for this, as usual, are Tarek St. Laurent and Andy McGrath. Hello, guys. Hey, how you doing? Hi, Scott. Hey. So, when we left off last time, we were looking at the neck. And we looked at the fact that most likely the Zia Maru carcass had somewhere around seven or eight neck vertebrae, which doesn't match up with what we know of fossil plesiosaurs, which had at a minimum 13 vertebrae, cervical vertebrae. But it does match up with turtles, and mosasaurs. Uh, as we saw at the end of the last episode, the turtle has, I believe, eight neck vertebrae. Hang on a second here. Either seven or eight. Let's see. I think we said seven, but I might be misremembering. Well, I'm bringing up the figure here now and will tell me. Let's see. Uh, seven. Okay, now I'm going to send you guys an image of a mosasaur neck from the mosasaur platycarpus. Let me see here. All right. Okay, just let me get the picture up here. Let's see. You got that? Got it. All right, so we've got one, okay, where it says first first dorsal. You're going forward from that. It says one, two, three, four, five, six. So six, seven, seven maximum for a mosasaur. Mm. So what this tells us is that it doesn't, Whatever the Zeomaru carcass was, if it was a reptile, it didn't have neck architecture like a plesiosaur by cervical count, but it had a neck like a sea turtle, a leatherback, or a mosasaur. And since yeah, mosasaurs, right. since mosasaurs and sea turtles live in the sea and are marine reptiles. This says that, yeah, this thing could be a marine reptile based on the cervical count. Mm. And what is it for sharks? Doesn't match up. Yeah, well, well, you remember what we compared? It had, was mm. basically had the same count as the Parker's Cove car, carcass. Yeah, okay. Which was we, 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 we settled that at the end of the last episode. So, yes. <clears throat> so this this evidence right here is ambiguous. Now, 
based on what we know of fossil plesiosaurs, we said that it had plesiosaurs that we know of in the fossil record from 60 million years ago had a minimum vertebral, cervical vertebral count of 13 vertebrae. But who's to say that if some kind of plesiosaur survived past that presumed extinction date, given an additional 60 million years, couldn't have reduced its cervical vertebrae to seven or eight. Hmm. You know, I mean, right. it's, it's speculation, but it's not impossible. So that's about all we can do with that. But something I think that is sort of peripherally significant here, and this has been used to be an argument for the shark hypothesis is the fact that in 1977, some commercial fishermen actually took a complete unmutilated basking shark carcass and trimmed it to look like the Zio Maru carcass. Mm. Now, hang on, I'm going to bring up that image. I just got to find it. All right, bear with me here. Um, So what are your thoughts on that? You, you, you go, Karen. <laughs> well, I guess the most I can say is is that it's uh, it's definitely really interesting, and again, and, and, you know, it, it still definitely perpetuates the entire point, which is that the evidence is so difficult to come to any positive conclusion on with the with the vertebrae count. It suggests a number of different organisms generally fall into the same category, aside from the shark theory, um, which is obviously the prevailing theory and, and has the most reason to it. But it's uh, it's just one of those little details that really leaves doors more and more cracked open, so to speak. Mm. And I'm um, I'm still with the character. I'm still stuck on the pectoral girdle because the the turtle and the mosasaur pectoral girdle don't the, the alleged pectoral petrol girdle that we can see don't match the, the, the vertebrae count on the neck, but the basking shark still does. So it has a double match there, the petrol girdle and and the vertebrae um, column. So I think that's a better match at the moment still from what we, um, well, what we know from is, these fossil specimens. The thing is, people point to the basking shark evidence and say that this more simply accounts for the data than um, some kind of hypothetical reptile. Mm -hmm. But there are things about, like, we don't know for sure whether the skeleton was bony or cartilaginous. Mm -hmm. And even if it was a shark, a basking shark, the cranium of a basking shark is calcified cartilage, which is hardened cartilage, which makes it bony-like. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And you can't determine one way or the other which is which from a photograph. That's that's which is the why truth. Molecular evidence is so important relative this mm. question. Oh, good grief. Here we it go. It reminds me so much of the uh, the edited sketch where the, the body segment is uh, longer than in the original sketch, and I wonder if that has any um, anything to say about the, the, the vertebrae count or the strange placement and orientation of the pectoral girdle and, and such. Yeah, well, you see, if you adjust Yano's sketch to the measurements he made <clears throat> and look at where the rear appendages are, that is an argument against it being any kind of fish. Hmm. Because Fujio Yasuda said that based on the measurements by Yano, that the rear pelvic fins or flippers <clears throat> 
<clears throat> we're in too posterior a position to be any mm. known species of fish. Yeah. But now, that, but... you know, this is soft evidence. You know, there's all kinds of ways that you could say, well, we weren't there. We don't know if, if, if Yano made a mistake in his measurements or if the body was so deteriorated as he was measuring it, it stretched out longer than it actually was and distorted the features, you know, so we don't know. But nevertheless, right. that is one of the points of contention against the basking shark theory. So, anyway, looking at this picture I just sent you, mm. you'll see the Zia Maru carcass on the left. On the right is the carcass that was carved by the fisherman. You can see them standing next to the carcass. Now, it very much resembles, they very much resemble each other, but one thing you'll notice is that the primary difference, and they should have um, done something about this, they didn't cut the belly open of the carcass that they trimmed, and its belly is not split open in the bottom part, missing what, what you see on the Zio Maru carcass. Mm. And that's part of why, looking at the trim carcass, you see the petrol fins kind of bunched up, and you can't see the petrol girdle, obviously, because the belly's not split up. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, looking at the head and the neck portion, you do see a lot of resemblance. Now, this originally appeared in a Japanese magazine called Diving World. And I'm about to read an English translation of the original article that accompanied the picture. Bear with me here. All right, let me see. But a lot of people point to this and say, see, this proves that it was a, a basking shark. Not necessarily. Mm. It is very persuasive evidence, however, though. Mm. Just, just from a glance, Scott, before you read that, even the placement of what appear to be the eye sockets seem to be in a different place on the head. And the Zia Maru yeah. carcass, if I'm right in thinking, those eyes are because they, they appear to be on the top of the head. Well, we'll get to that when we get mm. into the discussion about the cranium. Uh -huh. I've got a lot to say about that. I bet you have. Excellent. I just got to find this article. Let me see here. Okay. This is from Diving World, number 29, January 1978. <clears throat> Appearance of a double of the new Nessie. The basking shark whose lower jaw and gills were removed surprisingly resembled the new Nessie, as you can see below. In the afternoon of November 12th, Mr. Sogo Takatsu, 58 years old, who is working at a seafood company at the Onohama Port, Iwaki City, Fukushima Province Prefecture, Prefecture, carried out an experiment for unveiling the enigma of the new Nessie. He dismantled a basking shark of eight meters long and five tons. Two articles on the new Nessie have been published in our magazine. Owing to this experiment, however, the enigma was resolved. A romance of the sea was put to an end. So, there you go. It is what it is. So, anyway, that's certainly relevant to this discussion we've been having about the neck. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's move on to the head. Mm -hmm. Let me see here. All right. I put together a montage that shows all the views of the head. Let's see.
All right, do you see that? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yes, across indeed. The top, across the top, you've got the two. I guess it would be the left side of the head views next to each other, the two photographs. Mm. And you see that center portion that looks like an eye socket, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I see that. All right, then below that, you've got a view, two views of the other side of the head. And if you look carefully at the photo on the middle left, you'll see a round blobby thing poking out that looks like it might be the corresponding eye socket on the other side of the head. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah, I got that. I got it's that. round yeah. and it's sort of poking out from the side of the head. Mm -hmm. Right, like the area where there's kind of some flesh look. in that circular. Yeah, okay, so that's that. And then the white looking head is the, the, the image of the, the same side of the head laying on the deck of the ship. Yeah, I can see You know, that. it looks like, you know, as it was laying on the deck of the ship, it dried and the color sort of changed to a whitish color. Mm. And then below that are Yano's sketches of the head viewed from the side and viewed from the front. Mm. His interpretations. All right. Let me get another figure here. Let's see. Uh, where am I looking at? Okay, this is that same image with another image over on the right side. And you remember how we were discussing that some people thought that what you're looking at for what is assumed to be the side of the head is actually the top of the head twisted. Hmm. And in the montage on all the way on the right, what you're looking at is you're looking at the top of the cranium of the Stronza Beast at the very top, showing this foramen opening in the top of the skull or the cranium. Mm. Epiphyseal foramen, they call it. And then for comparison, in the middle, there is the head of the Zeo Maru carcass. So what this is trying to say is that what looks like an eye socket may be that foreman on top of the skull being viewed from the side and mistaken for an eye socket. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom image is the top of a cranium of a basking shark. Oh, I see. So basically what the image is trying to convey, and I think it's extremely ambiguous, is that you can see those two flared uh, pieces of the cranium supposedly poking out from the top and the bottom mm -hmm. of that Zia Maru head. I don't necessarily buy that interpretation, but it is possible. So anyway, uh, let me show you something else here. Um, This is the dorsal and ventral view of a basking shark cranium unmutilated. Hmm. So the image on the left is the top view. And you can see that foreman there in the middle. Now, the image on the right is the ventral view or the looking at the same cranium from below. And as you can see, you don't see a corresponding foramen opening like that on the bottom of the skull corresponding to the same position as you see on the top. Correct? Yeah. Um, All right. Now, 
because of the state of the mutilation of okay. the heart, this is ambiguous. But if you'll go back to that first image that I sent, like I said before, you see what appears to be a corresponding socket mm. for an eye on either side of the Zia Maru cranium. Mm -hmm. So that makes me question this idea that we're looking at the top and the bottom of the skull turned sideways. Yeah. And even if we were, it's it's so hard to spot what the key differences would be between the basking shark uh, skull or cranium and the cranium of the the Stronze beast, because the key difference that you could see right away seems to be the manner in which the cranium tapers towards the end, because the Stronze beast has a rather robust end to it, and the basking shark one tapers. And you just can't really see if that's the case or not with, with the Zoya Maru carcass. It's got too much flesh in that area to really see that definitively. Yeah. Um, hang on a second here. <clears throat> I gotta find something. Bear with me. Sure thing. What do you think so far, Andy, of that comparison? Um I mean, clearly it's it's not the same as the basking shark skull. As you pointed out, the end is why would it be tapered like that? Well then that's not the the shape of a, a basking shark cranium. It, it it seems like it's it's I can see with the the circles show that it seems to be an exact match for the um the Zumaru carcass, but in the same way, it's kind of like a paradolia in a sense, as you pointed out. You put the mm, circles in one yeah. place. We could have circled three other parts and, and made the same well, thing. Yeah, that's, it's so fleshy and indistinct. That reflects on what you think the Zumaru carcass is likely to be as well. Yeah, I think so. But I'm, I mean, I mean, if you're convinced that it's a shark, yeah. and you're looking for shark features to confirm yes. that it's a basking shark, then you're going to look at that idea and say, "Yeah, that makes sense." And that's yeah. the the pareidolia problem again. It's it's in yep. such a decayed and fleshy state. Any close exactly. examination yields yep. the results you want, and the, I see a yep. point. Really, so that's yeah. That's also instructional about looking at blurry alleged lake monster photos too. Mm -hmm. The same problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or you could even compare it to the standing wave in a sense. You can read whatever shape you want into one of those. I think this, at least in its uh, minutia, this fleshy carcass um, could yield the results you want if um, properly presented. Yeah. Well, do you guys mind if we take a short break so I can look for this image I'm looking for? No, that's cool. Sure thing. Yeah, that's All right. Cool. Thank you. All right, the image that you're looking at now the bottom image is the head of the Zio Maru carcass laying on the deck of the ship. The top image is the cranium of a basking shark that washed up a few years back in a place called Dolly Mount, somewhere in the UK. I think it might be around Cornwall. I just don't know off the top of my head, but it's definitely in the UK. So anyway, what you're looking at is the, the basking shark from Dolly Mount, the cranium, you're looking at the top of it, but it's laying over sideways. And the circles are meant to represent the edges of the cranium poking out. Uh, so okay. the two images were put together by Marcus Hemmler to attempt to demonstrate that the head of the Zia Maru carcass has turned sideways in most of the pictures, which is getting back to this idea that maybe what looks like an eye socket is in fact the epithelial foramen in the top of the cranium. But like I said, it's ambiguous. 
Um, so that's about all we can do with that. Let me uh, bring up another image here. Hang on. Let's see. Okay, assuming that what you're looking at on the Zio Maru carcass are eye sockets, in fact, and that the head is being viewed in the normal sideways position, there are several basking shark carcasses with craniums like this. <clears throat> Usually what a mutilated basking shark cranium looks like is a turtle or plesiosaur skull with eye sockets, a missing lower jaw, and no teeth in the upper jaw. Mm -hmm. So what you're really looking at in the case of basking sharks, in reality, all the jaws are already gone. They've already fallen off. And all you're left with is the top part of the cranium, which looks like a turtle. Now, these various um, illustrations illustrate that fact, or photographs. Now, if you look across the top, the one on the extreme right is the uh, Deepdale monster from, oh, what year? Uh, 1942. Uh -huh. And as you can see, can see the two eye sockets. See that? Uh huh. All right. The image directly below that is the Man Hill monster that washed up in Skituate, Massachusetts. Okay. In 1970. And you can see some resemblance between that and the image of the head of the Zio Maru carcass laying on the deck of the ship, which is right next to it. Yeah. Left of it. And then at the very bottom left is a photograph of the Parker's Cove monster cranium. Uh -huh. Yeah. And as you can see on the right, I put together various diagrams showing how the jaws fall off of a basking shark cranium. Mm. And it gets ground down. And the very final image at the bottom right is supposedly what the Stronsa Beach cranium looked like viewed from the left side. That's very interesting. Yeah. It's interesting to such an extent. You mentioned the uh, the ways in which that basking sharks decompose tend to so specifically resemble so many of these, especially with the whole idea of the lower jaw missing and things like that. Yeah. It, it really kind of contextualizes the fact that the Zoyu Maru carcass looks the way it does because it just fits so many of those patterns and looking at more of these examples just kind of solidifies that more and more well i'm about to throw a, a monkey wrench in things <laughs> Bear with i was me. waiting for that wrench it's coming i just gotta find the image this is very interesting Okay, bear with me here. Uh, let me see. Here we go. Now, what if I told you that a plesiosaur fossil had actually been found where the lower jaw fell off the upper part of the cranium and all the teeth fell out. Okay. That actually happened. Now I'm going to read you what it says here. At the very top, you see the picture of the Zero Maru cranium laying on the deck of the ship. And this is a quote from one of the papers. This is from the paper called On the Nature of the Carcass of a Large Vertebrate Found Off New Zealand by... Yoshi Kazu Hasegawa and Teruya Oyeno. And it says, 
if it were a plesiosaur, the body would not take on the bent posture as shown in the photograph, provided the front limbs remained because the breastbone is large. Mm -hmm. Also, some sets of costal-like bones on the ventral side, which is talking about the gastral ribs, which are located in the abdomen of plesiosaurs, are also absent in this creature. According to Yano's observations, the head of the animal resembled that of a turtle, but plesiosaurian reptiles have somewhat triangular skulls. At this point of decomposition, some teeth should still be remaining in the upper jaw. If the degree of decomposition is advanced to the point that the front portion of the skull had fallen off, the shape of the body should be more distorted, if not destroyed. From the osteological point of view, we conclude that the creature does not belong to the plesiosaurian reptiles. Okay, now moving on to the plesiosaur paper. Uh, this is from a paper called Cranial Anatomy and Functional Morphology of Pliosaurus brachyspondylus, Reptilia plesiosauria from the Upper Jurassic of Westbury, Wilshire. by Michael A. Taylor and Arthur Crookshank. So you can see the figure on the left, on the bottom left, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to read from the text. It says, an exceptionally complete skull, mandible and other bones of Pliosaurus brachyspondylus were collected from the Kimmeridge clay of Westbury, Wilshire in 1980. The recovery and preparation of this large specimen required special techniques. The specimen is apparently part of the more complete skeleton mostly destroyed before discovery. The decayed carcass is a, was apparently disrupted so that the skull finally lay upside down over many of its teeth which had fallen out while the mandible lay several meters away. The reasons for this are unclear. So as you can see, there's a photograph of the cranium <clears throat> all the way to the right. So at least we've got one case we can point to where the teeth fell out of the upper cranium and the jaw fell off of a plesiosaur specimen. So it's only one case, but it still says that it is possible that a plesiosaur a recently dead one, if they're still around, could still be found mm -hmm. in this condition after it died. It's interesting the uh, the placement of the eyes on that plesiosaur skull too, because it looks a lot like Yano's sketch of where the eyes are on the Zaymaru carcass. Yeah, well, I'm bringing up another figure here. Hang on, uh, let's see. Find out where I'm at here. Uh, okay. Let me see here. So, you know, just when you think that, okay, this cinches it as being a shark, something like this pops up, you know? Exactly. It's. It seems like the the attempts to reach a truly definitive conclusion, which, you know, there are conclusions that are way more likely, but definitiveness seems like a ping pong battle at this point. I just think it's really sad that the people who discuss the basking shark hypothesis can at least acknowledge the ambiguities and at the very least use it to show why people were so convinced it was a plesiosaur, even if you don't think it was one. Yeah, right. the, some acknowledgement of, of what led at least Yano to, to yeah, come to that I mean, conclusion I mean, is this, needed. It the was the ship's even biology. If you believe, even if you believe it's just a mutilated basking shark, this is important points to show how somebody could be mistaken. Hmm. You know, at the very least, this illustrates that point very sharply. 
<clears throat> okay. Bringing up this image, what you're looking at here is an actual comparison of the head of the Zio Maru carcass with leatherback turtles and a specific type of plesiosaur, which had a short, blunt skull called Zarapasaurus from Morocco. <laughs> this particular plesiosaur had a skull that resembled, it had a head like a sauropod dinosaur, which is interesting because a lot of the people that claim to see these lake monsters, a lot of time instead of saying, oh, it looked like a plesiosaur, they say, oh, it looked like a brontosaurus. Mm. Right. And as you can see, the short, blunt skull of this particular, like a like plesiosaur, resembles the skulls of sauropod dinosaurs, particularly a brontosaurus. So what you're looking at across the top here are the four images of the head of the Zio Maru carcass, the actual photographs. And then on the extreme right is the skull of Zarapasaura. And then wow. down at the very bottom, below that on the right side, is four views from four different angles of the skull of Zarapasaura. And then on the extreme left, bottom left is the cranium of a leatherback turtle. Yeah. So, you know, if you took the teeth out of that skull of Zarapasaurus and took the lower jaw off, you'd have something very much that resembles the cranium of a sea turtle and the cranium of mm. the Zia Maru carcass. If you follow me here. I do. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it generally seems to really... Uh... I mean, this the slope of the of the head and where the eyes are placed and the angle of everything is so similar. And another thing that's interesting too, <clears throat> the nostrils of plesiosaurs are always in front of the eyes. Usually, on long snouted plesiosaurs, they appear to be somewhere in the middle of the snout because they got a longer snout. But if you look at how short the face of Zarapasaura is, you see that they're almost to the end of the skull like what you see on a sea turtle. Which is very interesting. The, the skulls of plesiosaurs can come in many different shapes and sizes. There's a lot of biodiversity in the skull shape. Right. And the length of the snout, so, you know. I mean, look at the head of uh, Chronosaurus. Look how long it is compared to this. I mean, that's huge. So I've got more stuff. Hang on. Uh, let me see here. Uh, where is that picture? Uh, okay, this is to show how much a basking shark cranium can look that way, too. So on the left, like you're looking at <clears throat> the Parker's Cove monster. Below that is the skull of Zarapasara. Then on the lower right is the skull of a leatherback. And oddly enough, you've got a creature reported from Jacksonville, Florida, the so-called St. John's River Monster with a brontosaurus-like head, which also resembles Zarapasara. So... You can see kind of where I'm going with all this, right? Mm. All right. I mean, it could yeah. be, yeah. Right. I mean, it could be a a, a a visual stand in at least, very yeah. least. Well, I mean, it just shows how ambiguous all this is. Mm. You know? 
Um, bear with me here, Matt. Uh, get to what I'm looking for here. Um, so jump in with uh, your thoughts on this. Okay. Well, the first thing that I think of <laughs> a lot is, um, you know, those the eye sockets that we see on all of these craniums is um, it's really interesting, especially with the um, what is the most recent photo that you just sent, Scott? The carcass in that photo is that the Stronze beast you said, or a different one? That's the Parker's Cove monster. Parker's Cove monster, which we know was a basking shark. It was um, definitely a basking shark. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do here <clears throat> is show you a definite basking shark to see. The resemblance there. Yeah, the thing that I noticed the most is what were misinterpreted, or or not misinterpreted, but um, what were thought to be at first the eye sockets of plesiosaur look so much uh, wider and deeper on the Parker's Cove carcass than on the Zoyumaru carcass, um, where they're kind of uh, small and you might not notice them right away if you weren't looking for them. So I'm not sure what significance that possibly has, but it's oh, interesting. I know. I mean, you know, the only way we could find out what the significance was is to go back on a time machine and be on the deck of the Zion Maru while it was happening, right. which is highly unlikely to happen. It is highly unlikely. That's a good way to describe that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I can just picture Scott now running towards the end of the deck, screaming something in Japanese as they throw that thing over the side. Yeah. Oh, good. Exactly. Grief. It's like Back to the Future. Mm. Guys, I hate to do it to you again, but I'm going to have to stop the recording. That's, That's okay. all right. Just bear with me here. Okay, so what you're looking at there is I've taken the skull of Zarapasara and removed the lower jaw. And I've got it pretty much well side by side with the cranium of the Zeomaru carcass. And at the very bottom, I've took and I've used the eyeballs to line up and kind of superimpose one image over the other. And the similarities with plesiosaurs do not just cover Zarapasaura. There are others as well. Hang on a second here. That top of the jawline in particular with the plesiosaur seems to kind of uh, match some of the angles that we see on the Zoyamaru head. Yeah. Uh, all righty, let me see here. Um, you're familiar with a Jurassic English plesiosaur called Cryptoclitus, correct? That's right. Yes. Cryptoclitus was brought up a lot by um, <clears throat> Dennis Tucker and Tim Dinsdale in regards to the origins of the Loch Ness Monster. Huh. So what you're looking at here in the second image I just sent, the very top are the two sketches that Yano did of the carcass for his drawings, showing the skull from the side and from the front. And then the lower image is the same plesiosaur skull of a cryptoclidus specimen that was missing its teeth. I can't remember exactly where this plesiosaur specimen is. Maybe in Paris, possibly. Uh -huh. But anyway, you can see the resemblance right there. And I think that's that's um you know it's a it's a pretty good representation of it. It kind of reminds me again of something that's playing on my mind the whole time that Yano, he must have got a really close look at this thing much closer than the pictures um, um, anyway at the, at what we can see there and yet he drew this thing albeit something that doesn't match anything that we know and yeah. uh, perhaps the, the dimensions weren't 
very accurate according to the, the measurements he took. But still, you know, he drew that and for all intents and purposes, it looks it looks like a blizzard okay. sword. Here's the same sketch compared with a leatherback turtle mm -hmm. skull from both angles. And again, there's a resemblance there too. Yeah. Now, <sighs> we're talking Archelon here, you know, are we? King of the Turtles. Well, um, Archelon, Father of all turtles. Yeah. Archelon was basically a leatherback on steroids. Mm hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so. Archelon got 12 feet long. Wow. Wow. Christ. And even that doesn't cover it. That doesn't cover it for the specimen we have here. Yeah. Mm. Right. Now this is looking at the cranium of the deck on the deck of the ship of the Zuyamaru compared with the infamous and controversial gargoyle head photograph taken at Loch Ness in 1975. Now, a lot of people believe that the tree trunk <coughs> retreat from Loch Ness in 1987 was the mm -hmm. object in the gargoyle head photograph. Regardless, you can still see some resemblance between the gargoyle head and the head of the Zeomaru carcass. Mm. Do you see it? A little. <laughs> On the it bottom, is... on the bottom left, is an actual plesiosaur skull. Mm. So I see some resemblance in all three of these images, but, you know, you can take the gargoyle head off the table and still make a convincing case. Mm. You know, but anyway. Especially with that narrow head. kind of... Right, especially since the head on the plesiosaur, again, tapers to a narrow edge at the end, very much like what could be the front of the Zuyamaru head. All right. Well, going back to the Cryptoclitus head, I want you to notice something. Looking at the Cryptoclitus head from the side, the image on the left, behind the eye socket, you see another big opening. Mm -hmm. See that? Yeah. Okay, that is a di diagnostic feature of plesiosaurs and of a lot of reptiles, but in the case of plesiosaurs, this is called the temporal opening. And what it is for is for the attachment of jaw muscles to work mm -hmm. the lower jaw to give strength to the lower jaws. The brain sat in a pocket in between the two temporal openings on either side of the skull. They had, Plesiosaur had very tiny brains. Wow. Almost like a crocodile. Crocodiles are built, their skulls are built very similar. They have, the, the brain is in the middle of a bar between those two temporal openings. If you look at the top of the skull, you'll see two pairs of those, a pair of those openings behind the eyes and they're almost positioned like eye sockets, too. Uh -huh. So if you can imagine a living plesiosaur, you would see bundles of muscles coming off, attached to that hole. Okay. And then the other end would attach to the lower jaw. And that's to right. work the jaw so they could eat. Or open their mouth and close their mouth. So that's what those openings are for. Now, mm -hmm. you go back to the Zuyamaru carcass. Um, let me see here. And you don't see what appears to be a temporal opening. Mm -hmm. Well, now look how much skin is left on the cranium. There very well could be a temporal opening there, and it's covered by fat or skin or whatever. Okay. So the fact that you don't see a temporal opening there does not mean that that was not the cranium of some kind of sauropterygian reptile that we don't know uh -huh. of. So. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. interesting. Yeah, so... One point I was talking about with Carrick before we started recording is the fact 
that the crew reported the skull felt hard. Now, that comes down to whether the skull was made out of cartilage like a shark or bone like a tetrapod or a bony fish. Now, the interesting thing is parts of the basking shark skeleton, even though it is cartilage, the cranium is calcified cartilage, which mm -hmm. means it's particularly hard cartilage. That probably to the fill would not be indistinguishable from bone. Mm -hmm. So in other words, calcified cartilage is a particularly hard type of cartilage that occurs in the bones of some sharks, particularly the cranium. And wasn't that also a suggestion of, of uh, the feeling of hard structures within the flippers? I felt yes, like phalanges. Yes. Well, what that was based on is that some of the crew, probably Yano and maybe the captain and some of the other crew, said they stepped on the fins on the deck of the ship, and it felt like they were hard with hard materials inside the fin. Mm -hmm. They didn't physically, yeah, you know, they didn't visually observe these pieces, but it said it felt like yeah. there was something hard in the fence. Now, whether that was the radial elements of sharks or it was carpal bones of a, of a reptile, we just don't know. So there's only so much we can do with that. Yeah. But yeah. one last thing I want to point out here, and this blew my mind before we move on to the middle part of the body. And I guess we can we can stop at this point and pick it back up on the next session. Sure. One last thing is let me show you this. This is very interesting. All right, you see these images? Okay, that's a look. Okay, what you're looking at, what you're looking at on the extreme left is the cranium, a dorsal view of the cranium of a basking shark. The other four images are of a Cretaceous suction feeding turtle, giant sea turtle, called Ocepeshalon. Mm -hmm. Now, as you can see, the shape of Ocepeshalon's skull is very similar to what you see on the dorsal view of this basking shark skull. Yeah, that's incredible. Those I are know. you could you could mistake those two for each other. Absolutely. You really good. Now let me show you the side view. All right, what you're looking at at the very top. Is the side view of an unmutilated basking shark cranium without the jaws. Below that is a side view of the cranium of the Stronza beast. Then on the other side of that is another view of a side view of a basking shark cranium. And the bottom two images are the cranium of Ocepeshalon view from the side. Very impressive. So it just goes to show you that <clears throat> there were some very strange fossil marine reptiles with skulls that could be very easily mistaken for the skull of a, a cranium of a basking shark and vice versa. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, let's... Um, Let's wrap up this session and pick it back up next time. Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, look, that's that's um, okay. Before we move on to the trunk of the Zia Maru thing. There's a couple of uh, last minute things regarding the head I'd like to get in. 
let me uh, find this image I'm looking for here. What parts of the head are we looking at now? Well, I haven't I haven't put up the uh, image yet. Hang on. Let me see here. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, this montage I just uploaded includes four images of the Zuyo Maru carcass, but the upper left one is a plesiosaur that's only known from one specimen called Pachycostosaurus donni. And if you look at the image of the mounted skeleton there, you'll see that the head it's missing a lower jaw and it's basically mutilated to where it looks almost like nothing. I mean, look at the shape the head's in. Mm. And compare that with the cranium of the Zio Maru carcass. So this kind of comes back to that other plesiosaur that I mentioned that was found with the uh, bottom jaw missing and all the teeth gone. And if you can look at the blob of the skull that's left of this thing, you can see that it sort of resembles the cranium of the Zio Maru carcass in the state that it's in. It does. Where yeah. in the world is this plesiosaur found? Uh, somewhere in England. Interesting. Got I it. don't think it was Lyme Regis, but it was somewhere, maybe mm. Weldon, which is another Jurassic fossil deposit in England. Hang on, I've got another oh. image of it by itself. Is um, this a, a, a Jurassic era plesiosaur specimen? Yeah. Technically, it's a God. pliosaur. But a right. lot of what they call pliosaurs had fairly long necks. So, And as I showed you before, there was a whole montage Showing going from the shortest neck plesiosaur all the way to elasmosaur, so there were grades in between. So, you know, right, the different morphotypes evolved in different lineages. So, basically, the whole plesiosaur plesiosaur dichotomy is pretty artificial, really. You know, because you had ones like Romeliosaurus and um. The leptoclitids that were technically pliosaurs but had long necks. So, you know. Right. Had this kind, kind of, of a slippery slope there. Fringe pliosaurs and fringe plesiosaurs, right? Yeah. And remember, we were talking about why the Zio Maru carcass was unlikely to be a whale shark? Vaguely. Run it by us again, though. All right, well, it has to do with this, the shape of the um, whale shark cranium. Ah, oh, okay, right. I'm about to uh, show you a diagram here. Oh, that's the one that's almost shaped right? like a, a hammerhead? Sort of, yes. Or a ray. It's got these wide processes. It's got a wide catfish-looking head. And as you can see from these diagrams here, and there's actually a photograph of the cranium of one laying on a beach, you would see those wide horns or whatever you want to call them coming out the sides of the cranium like you see of that one laying on the beach there. And that illustration on the um, left shows the view of the complete cranium unmutilated looking at it at the top of it. And then the two images on the right, the, the, the illustrations, are looking at the cranium. The top one is with the jaws from the side, and then the bottom one is just the cranium without minus the jaws. But anyway, that 
that pretty much illustrates why the Zuyo Maru carcass was unlikely to be a well shark based on the cranium. Yeah, there's definitely those very stark differences, and yeah. not even by the protrusions at the side of the whale shark cranium, but the whale shark cranium just seems wider as well, a bit more robust. Yeah. yeah. So it's extremely rare to find skeletal remains like that of the whale shark. I really had to do some digging to find these images. I and imagine. One final question I think is important to establish is that you know how the basking shark the jaws fall away and the cranium's left and it looks like a plesiosaur well the question arises does that ever happen to any other kind of shark well mm. the answer is very rarely but yes okay this is an image of a carcass that was found in Biddeford, Maine, in 1967. And as you can see, it looks like a plesiosaur's cranium with a long neck and a flipper attached to it. Now, the illustration on the upper left is the cranium of a thresher shark. So Marcus Himmler looked at this trying to identify it and came to the conclusion that yes, this was a thresher shark, which is a different family of sharks than the basking shark, and is a carnivorous shark, not a plankton feeder. So this is the only concrete case that I can point to to show you where this has happened with a different kind of shark than a basking shark. So the answer is yes it can happen to other kinds of sharks. And when people find these carcasses, they need to be aware of this, you know? All right. Is there an anatomical reason that the jaws fall off sometimes before the rest of the body decomposes? Well, you know, let's say the carcass is floating around on the bottom and uh, the scavengers come in and they start chewing at the soft parts. I mean, we just don't know. Obviously, I mean, it happens. You look at the way generally sharks are built, you know, they're, they're built, the jaws are a separate piece from the cranium. So, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, right. You know, the jaws fall off and it's, it's going to look, and apparently with this thresher shark, you can see that the pectoral girdle is gone too. And basically everything, that's some kind of a fin, either a dorsal fin or a second dorsal fin or possibly a pelvic fin. It's so far back, I would think it's probably a pelvic fin or a second dorsal right, or right. anal fin, you know? Mm. Um, hang on, I'll bring up a generalized shark skeleton and you can see Great. What it looks like. Um, let me see here. Um, bear with me here. This should work. Um, So as you can see, you know, just about any kind of shark, if you took the jaws off of it and removed the gill arches too, mm -hmm. you're going to have the vertebrae going up to the cranium. So it's, you know, in almost any kind of case, if you did this artificially, it's going to look like a neck with a small head on it. So. Yeah, in the last episode, of course, we, or earlier in this part, I should say, we, we saw the uh, the mutilated basking shark that was meant to replicate the Zoyamaru carcass, and that was perfectly displayed there. Yeah, well, this happened with basking sharks, guys, I don't know how many times. But we pretty much well discussed the neck, 
and the cranium. So now let's move on to the body. Let me find the pictures I'm looking for here. Um, let's see. Um, Well, while I'm looking for this picture, why don't you guys comment so we don't have dead air time. Sure. What are your thoughts on this so far, Andy? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, the more we look at this, this carcass, um, the more we look at cases of um, basking shark decay, it definitely makes sense to me that it would be a basking shark again in my mind i always revert back to the the onboard testimony of, of the ship's marine biologist and those others who testify to the strange appearance of this animal from the beginning which of course is why we're here um but really i think that the basking shark identity is very hard to dispute very, very hard to dispute at this point. Yeah, well, you can see why so many people are so insistent that it was just simply a mutilated shark. Mm. Oh, yeah. I think one of the pieces we've gone over that really, like, unexpectedly drives that home is the, uh, the, the thresher shark picture that you showed us, Scott, because at that point, it kind of recontextualizes the situation where it's not just you know by some small percentage chance these basking sharks wash up like this it's it's like no this seems to actually be a pretty common pattern of decomposition in sharks and even just by looking at a shark skeleton we actually expect that pattern of decomposition at some point well it happens on a regular basis with the basking shark uh, and now when they find these carcasses, unlike 30, 40 years ago, they have molecular technology they can apply to these carcasses mm. to show from the DNA that it definitely was a basking shark. So, you know, ones that are found today, there's usually no question. Okay. Right. Now, what you're looking at here, the top image is from Yano's sketch. And this is meant to illustrate the view of the carcass looking from, from the head backwards to the tail, showing the body configuration. So what you're seeing there, there's a dotted line meant to show where probably where the belly was that was gone. And you see the flanks of the body, right? Oh, yeah. All right, so what is at the very top is meant to represent the spinal column. And then supposedly coming over either side of the spinal column inside the trunk were short ribs, mm -hmm. which Yano claimed were 40 centimeters long. And he's got one drawn on either side of the spinal column. Now, what you're looking at at the bottom, the three images at the bottom, are the same perspective looking at the bodies of three different fossil plesiosaurs. So what you're looking at there, you look down the bottom, you see those belly ribs, the gastralia, that I talked about before. And then coming off, the um, transverse processes of the trunk vertebrae, you've got a set of ribs going down the side of the body to meet with the gastralia. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's fair. Okay, you're looking at the vertebrae, and it looks 
it's sort of an onk shape, like an Egyptian cross, right? You've got the central part of the vertebrae, what they call a centrum, and then you've got the two transverse processes, those two parts sticking out on either side, sticking out sideways. That's the transverse processes. And then you've got on top, you've got neural arches, and then on top of that, a neural spine. So this is all processes for the trunk musculature to attach to the backbone. You follow me? Absolutely, yeah. All right, so what you're looking at there, okay, normally plesiosaurs have longer ribs than what you see on the Zeomaru carcass. But mm. looking at the plesiosaur situation, how do we know that the short ribs that Yano has drawn in his drawing are not really transverse processes? Oh, I see. Do you follow okay. what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that those long ribs that are meeting up with the transverse processes could be missing. Okay. We already knew that the belly part was missing, so all the gastrocnemius would be gone. All I'm right. not saying that is the situation. I'm just pointing out that is a possibility. That's a, that's that's a good theory. Like that. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is though the debate goes is were those really ribs or were they strips of myocomata uh, connective tissue dividing the axial trunk musculature that were mistaken for ribs? Hmm. We just don't know. But the fact is, basking sharks are not supposed to have ribs of any kind. Ah. Hang on, I've got a direct quote about That's yeah, hang on a second here. I just got to find it. That really begs the question. Even if the Zayamaru carcass didn't have ribs, then what could Yano have been basing his sketch off of if there was that that almost perfect semi well, that's, shape? That's what I'm saying is that he could have mistaken those sheets of connective tissue dividing the axial trunk musculature for ribs by mistake because they would have looked like ribs. Do you think it would that semi-circle shape? Would, would muscle have helped keep that in place? Yeah, well, that's the myocomata in primitive tetrapods and fish are long sheets of connected tissue that under viewed under the right circumstances would look like ribs so without an actual rib that somebody brought back to confirm that it was a rib we are not sure and unfortunately that's the case with most yeah. of the material claims there so, yeah yeah you see this is why there was so much debate and why the evidence is so ambiguous Bear with me here a second. Oh, oh good grief. Where is it? Oh, hang on. One thing that's not exactly Zoya Maru related, but that I thought was interesting. I was looking at the diagram you just sent, Scott, with the... Uh, the Bure Miranesaurus, Miranesaurus, um, the arch of its of its ribs, and I noticed that it has, as the spinal column or the vertebrae, I should say, go up, uh, a bit of what the diagram suggests is like a hump on its back, and of course that's interesting because a lot of these plesiosaur type reports describe a humped back. Yeah, well, that you see, that's one reason I'm hesitant. To jump on board the turtle theory. Mm. Even the other back has an inflexible spine. So, you know, people have actually watched or claimed to have watched the shape of the Loch Ness monster's back changing into different configurations mm. of humps. 
And I just don't see how a turtle could do that. Right. All right. Are you guys familiar with Leonard Campagno, the shark expert? No. Well, he was no, a actually. on Jaws. He's considered to be one of the godfathers of shark anatomy. Um, this is a quote from a book he wrote. It says, and Marcus Himmler was kind enough to uh, dig this up for me. It says, citing Campagno, ribs are well-developed and elongated in many, many elasmobranchs, which are sharks. Ribs are reduced or lost in certain lamnoid sharks. And the lamnoid sharks includes the great whites <coughs> and the basking sharks and their relatives. It says, the basking shark as a lamnoid shark has lost them. Mm. And you can look at the skeleton above and you don't see any ribs. So, if the Zio Maru carcass definitely had ribs, it could have been a shark, but it was not a basking shark. Mm. Which is right, interesting. Right. So, now let me come back to what I was working on here. Hang on. There's a method to my madness. Just bear with me. I've actually got a question about the basking shark right now. So considering that when it first made the papers, this testing wasn't, um, the, the info hadn't necessarily been released on it yet. And of course, the initial report just being from people observing it. Why was specifically a basking shark jumped to, considering that we now know that a lot of other sharks can decompose like this? Well, it's, it's mostly when they find these carcasses, <clears throat> they're almost 99% of the time they are basking sharks. That threat of shark case was, was an anomaly. Mm. Right, okay. All the other ones that I am familiar with all turned out to be basking sharks. In Carrick, it's probably a lot to do with the, the size as well. That something of that size could be mistaken for you know, an unknown creature or a large sea monster, whereas smaller sharks decomposing in the same way probably wouldn't be so noteworthy. That's a good point, too. I think both of those are probably actually uh, equally explain this. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the other thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a big carcass like that is probably going to take longer to decompose and therefore more likely that somebody will find it if it watches the shore, you know? I guess. Yeah. All right, now, the picture I just sent is meant to illustrate myocomata, the axial trunk musculature with the divisions. In other words, between each axial trunk musculature, there is a sheet of white connected tissue dividing those muscles, and they connect to the spinal cord just like a muscle does, right? Mm -hmm. So the top illustration shows the myocomata of a shark. And then you've got a salamander in the middle, I think a mud puppy. And then below that is the lizard. So even reptiles have myocomata, but the further you go back in lineage to the more primitive animals, the more apparent it is. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. And you, you can even see the, the band of it in the shark is what would be the right shape if the spine was intact for Yano to have assumed this was a semicircular rib cage set if he was uh, yeah. and not actually looking at bones. Well, hang on, I've got another illustration that is very relevant to this whole question. <clears throat> Let me see here. Um, I 
All right. This is an illustration of a skeleton of a dogfish. Now, if you'll look at the trunk section, you'll no, see yeah. these little rib-looking things hanging down from the vertebrae. You see that? Mm -hmm. That is supposed to be remnants of strips of myocomata mm -hmm. hanging off of the trunk vertebrae. Interesting. Yeah, so if you saw that from a certain angle, you might think that that was a rib. A very short, right. rib, but it could still look like a rib. And I've got another picture of a shark carcass that washed up. I forget exactly where, but you can see the same thing in an actual photograph. Hang on. You mentioned they would look like short ribs, and that's exactly what, what Jan yeah. Willis did. But I've got an actual photograph that really illustrates it very well. If I can just find it here. Hang on. And based on the measurements and observations that Yano did, they estimated that there were 14 trunk vertebrae. Mm. Let's see here. Okay, give me a second here. Entertain the no. audience. <laughs> Andy, what are your thoughts on, on this, these new ribcage-related diagrams here? I think it's very interesting. Um, definitely looking at the carcass, there does appear to be... The shape could be mistaken for that, but again, my thoughts are that Yana would have had a much closer look at the carcass and at the inner workings of the carcass as well. He would have had that view. And I'm wondering, could he have mistaken this, this for, these for, for, for ribs in that situation? Did he not have a... That, he that he said the, the stomach only, was missing. That is and, the only uh, logical explanation that anybody can come up to counter that mm. but like i said before if those were ribs whatever the carcass was it was not right. a basking yeah. shark okay, no, it could have been a different kind of shark right it have to be one we didn't know about does the mega math shark have ribs i'm wondering That's you a, know i really another. don't know but i don't mm. think mega mouth gets anywhere near that big i think the biggest mega mouth is like 25 or a so sleeper I shark, something like that. Then a six kill. Um, it's it's related to the basking shark, mm. this, so it's a lamnoid shark. So odds are it probably wouldn't have roots. Yeah, so just, I'm looking at some mega mouse skeletons right now, and they're actually very similar to the dogfish, especially because the skull is, or the cranium, I should say, is actually very very tall, and if it decomposed. Mm. Uh, you probably wouldn't see the pattern that you're seeing of the Zoya Maru carcass just because oh, really? it's so large. Yeah. Well, the it's, cranium is different on the um, Mega Mouth too. So. Yeah. All right. Hang on. And to answer the question, the Megamouth uh, does have that same kind of uh, th those rib-like structures, but mm. they're actually not attached to the spinal column. Okay. Okay. Let me see here. I'm wondering about a Greenland shark or, or some sort of six-kilo sleeper shark. But would they well, be in that Greenland the sharks, world? I think, can get like, I don't know, 30 feet, possibly. Mm. They get big. They get as big as a great white, but I don't think yeah, they get 32 yeah. feet long. I mean, that's, you know. Let me see here. Don't tell me I've lost that picture. You haven't lost that picture. I hope not, but it's beginning to look like I can't find it. So, okay. pictures, I might be able to find it online somewhere. Oh, hang on. 
Greenland shark is 18 feet, by the way. Well, I knew they got big, but I just mm-hmm. couldn't remember exactly. Just for anybody listening out there, that's not that length, not even close to that length. No, yeah. Well, guys, I'm sorry. I can't find that stupid picture. That's okay. What was the picture of? The Mayo Kamada looking like ribs in a photograph. Uh, good grief. Hang on. Okay. So the, the Pacific sleeper shark, 22 feet. Just adding a, a few extra species to the mix. Yeah, it sounds like the sleeper is the closest contender with mm. here. The mega mouth, I think, also comes close, but the skull is, is just far too robust. Yeah. To made that pattern. All right, this is actually from <clears throat> the original 1978 papers. It's a generalized shark skeleton, pretty much like the dogfish image that I just showed. And it shows no ribs. Mm-hmm. Um, for comparison, hang on. That actually is fascinating how similar the skeletons of dogfish and sharks look. Well, mm. dogfish is a type of shark. Oh, well, there you go. I yeah, no and it's, um, it's used in dissection classes, or at least mm. used be used in dissection class as much in the same way that frogs were. That's super common here in UK waters. We should yeah. so fish for them all the time. The little shark it and it, it lives in fairly shallow water. Now this is to illustrate the rib situation with plesiosaurs. These are various different types. But you can see they have somewhat a set of ribs. So they do. Obviously, not quite as elongated a, a body trunk, but the mosasaur has an elongated body trunk. Hang on, uh, let me see here. I was going to say it seems like uh, Plesiosaur B's body model fits Zoyamaru the best. Well, there's the mosasaur situation. You can see they have ribs right up close to where the neck starts and the organs would be for the most part. And then once you get past the mid trunk, there's not much in the way of ribs. So, right, right. You know, I mean, there's so many unknown factors about, you know, what potential body parts could have fallen off the Zia Maru carcass. Were parts of the vertebrae missing? You know, all kinds of questions. Mm. Does what look what looks like the flank of the animal with myokamata muscle folds falling apart? Is that actually the spinal column? And parts of the vertebral processes have come off, and pieces are missing, and that explains those those holes there. I don't know. And I don't think anybody else does really either. So it just goes to show how ambiguous, if you really get down to the nuts and bolts of this thing, how ambiguous a lot of it is. Mm. And as I pointed out before, let me see here. Um, Bear with me.
pretend like we're on a a telethon on live television for 24 hours and we have to keep talking to keep the audience's interest. All right, all right. Um, let's see. Well, bringing up the the Mosasaur skeletons, has anyone posited that this is a Mosasaur or is that simply for like a comparison well, to plesiosaurs? You know, it was a possibility at the time as an alternative to the plesiosaur idea because according to Yano's measurements, the body was too elongated mm. to be a plesiosaur. So they jumped and said, well, maybe it's a mosasaur. Is there any mosas mosasaur species that has a head that would be that small? Well, in comparison to its body. You're looking at it right there. I just brought up. The bottom is oh, a Zio Maru. Oh, and go. the top is a Plesi is a Mosasaur. Well, so, what's the species called? Oh, oh God. Platycarpus, maybe? Uh -huh. okay, I think it's so either or Clydastes. And would the, would the vertebral, uh, uh, would, would it have the same vertebrae count as the neck as well? Well, yeah, um, basically, we went over that last time. That yeah, I mean, but I mean, this particular, right. so um, in general, yeah. they have that many, even when the neck is longer. Yeah, so anyway, okay. there you go for that. Um, where was I? Hang on here. Uh, let me see. Now, since Yano, did he make the length corrections, or was, were those made later on by somebody else to Yano's sketch? Uh, later on by somebody else. Right, so Yano believed it to be a plesiosaur, right? Well, he believed it to be not a shark. Right, yeah, that's right. He and didn't necessarily he, say it was a leaned, plesiosaur, but... Right, and he leaned towards marine reptile, but didn't know what species. Right, right. Yep, yep. All right, now here, relative to what you just asked, Andy, there is the cervical vertebrae of platycarpus. Okay. So you can count yeah. seven, yeah. eight vertebrae. And the same situation in a leatherback turtle so okay so <laughs> now let me see let me get back to what i was looking for here Let's... i wonder if the tail would have to be longer than the tail that's um or the tail section that's presented Ooh, the i don't know carcass. but based on the plesiosaur images we were looking at earlier the trunk mm. The view of the trunk going from end to end. This is an actual trunk vertebrae of a plesiosaur. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's got the two transverse processes coming off the side. Right. The neural arches and the neural spine coming off the top. And then at the sides of both of those transverse processes, there are those two long ribs. Now, if you took those two long ribs away, you might have something that resembled what um, Yano had on his sketch. Mm, yeah, yeah, right. All right, so hang on a second here. Um, this right here. It really illustrates that in different parts of the body, the plesiosaur had different ribs that connected to the transverse processes in different configurations. Now, one thing that's important to point out relative to basking sharks and plesiosaurs being mistaken for one another is that the transverse processes and the neural arches and the neural spine were evidently loosely connected to the central part of the vertebrae, which is called the center. And apparently, under certain circumstances, could 
fall off or brought off or whatever. They were connected apparently by spongy bone and probably part of the reason for that was to increase the flexibility of the backbone or the tail or the neck to give it more flexibility. You follow me? What do you? So anyway, um, lots of times those vertebrae as fossils are found with all those parts broken off. Yeah. So, and when they do, they look exactly like basking shark vertebrae, uh -huh. which I'm about to show you. And I think I showed you this once before. Um, okay. What you're looking at on the right are plesiosaur vertebrae with those processes broken off. Uh huh. And what you're looking at on the left are basking shark vertebrae. So essentially, yeah, in the circumstances, so they're shaped exactly the same way. Yeah, yeah, they're essentially identical. The only difference I can e even possibly posit would be that maybe the plesiosaur vertebrae look a bit more compressed, but there's no way you would tell that unless you measured them by hand. Well, they're they're petrified, they're mineralized, they're fossils, they turn to stone. That's true, right. But the shape is the same, but the difference is the basking shark vertebrae are made out of cartilage. Now, parts of the central part of the basking shark vertebrae are still cartilage, but they can be hard, they're calcified cartilage. But still, a fresh basking shark vertebrae would be recognizable as cartilage. Whereas mm. the plesiosaur vertebral centra would be bone. So if you had one of these vertebrae from one of these mystery carcasses to examine, you know, to physically examine, not just look at a photograph, you would be able to say, okay, this is bone, this is not a shark. Or you'd be able to say, this is cartilage, it's definitely a cartilaginous fish, probably a shark. But just looking at them in this state, you know, just looking at a photograph, it would be hard to tell the difference if those processes were broken off. Hmm. And what I'm saying is that that furrow you see on the back of the Zuya Maru carcass, if it was some kind of pseudo plesiosaurian reptile or something related to it, and those processes had broken off, they might explain those deep furrows if it was truly the backbone of the animal. You follow me? Yes. All right. Now, to show you how confusing some of this stuff can be, hang on. Um, let me see here. Um, bear with me. What are your thoughts right now, Andy, on this I like, whole situation? I, I like thoughts, but I'm incredibly angry with Vichyko Yano for not taking a more substantive as to sample from the creature. <laughs> like a couple of fibers, like, come on, cut out some of the mm. spinal cord. Keep the head. Keep the head and part of the neck. Nishiko. You know, that's, that's one of the biggest issues, is that it's um, it's so unfortunate that with a camera on board, Nobody was like, oh, Yano, you see a ribcage in there? Let's get a close-up of that ribcage. Yeah, Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. So only five photographs were taken. Yeah. yeah. And you One can't see, your detail you as well. can't see the, um, the rib-like structures in any of the photographs. Mm. At least he may have simply been... Mm, he yeah. may have simply been under the orders of the captain. Get a few pictures of that you thing. Make see, a sketch and you check can't it. see what structures are under the trunk behind... Yeah. The petrol girdle, really. 
Yeah. Now this image I just sent you, these are plesiosaur vertebrae in various states of decomposition with some of them's got the processes broke off and other ones don't. Mm -hmm. You see the differences? Yeah, well, yeah. That round central part is called the centra. Mm -hmm. And you take all those parts that stick off, off of it and it looks in shape exactly like a basking shark vertebrae. Yeah. Now, let me show you another picture. Hang on. This had everybody confused earlier in the week. Hang on. Okay. This image was posted on Flickr. And it said it was dried basking shark vertebrae sitting on the beach. Now, as you can see, most of them look exactly like basking shark vertebrae, right? But you see the one all the way over on the left? Mm -hmm. On the far left? It's got some kind of transverse processes coming out of it which shouldn't mm. be there if it's a basking shark. I see. Okay. So we were all confused, and I got together with, with, with Marcus and a couple of other people. We finally figured out that whoever posted this picture has posted whale vertebrae. Okay. And that on some of the whale vertebrae, like what I'm talking about with the plesiosaur situation, some of those transverse processes have broken off. And they look like plesiosaur vertebral centra, and they mm -hmm. also look like basking shark vertebrae. But whatever it was, it couldn't be a basking shark because basking sharks don't have those transverse processes coming off the side like that. So the only answer we could come up was that it was a whale. Mm -hmm. and now, as we will get to eventually, there have been carcasses that they weren't sure were either whales or basking sharks, and they had to use molecular technology to determine it. We'll get to that eventually, but anyway, this shows you the situation with the vertebrae, whether, you know, parts could have been broken off, and just because the vertebrae look like a basking shark does not mean necessarily that that's what they are. So, that pretty much well says about all we can say about the trunk, but hang on. I've got one more illustration I'd like to throw in there. Um, let me see here. Um, this is a detailed image of a generalized plesiosaur vertebrae. And as you can see, the two bottom pieces coming off there are those transverse processes. You'll see the suture, where it joins the main part of the vertebrae. I can see that. That would have been spongy bone to give that a little bit of movement. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the top, of the center part of the vertebrae, you see these two arches coming up, and they have a suture there too. Those are the neural arches, and then the big piece coming up off the top, the one central piece that looks like a shark fin, that is the neural spine. And the illustrations on the right are meant to illustrate what those vertebral centra look like without the process is coming off of them. Oh, okay. So what you can see are very much like a basking shark vertebrae. Mm. So uh, I think somewhere I have another illustration of what those ribs are supposed to look like on the carcass. Let me see here. Hang on. Let me see. It makes you wonder a bit about what the uh, 
the spinal column on Zoe Maru looked like to see if there was any uh, any leaning towards the orientation of those arches. Well, mm. you know, unfortunately, we can't go back in a time machine and look. So what we're left with is a bunch of ambiguous photographic evidence. Mm -hmm. And the tests that were done in 1978. So <clears throat> now this is not the re redone sketch with the elongated body trunk, but this is actually taking the original sketch and taking the fleshy flanks off of it to show the ribs. You see what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think possibly I've got somewhere with the adjusted body measurements. Let me see. Um... But still, I mean, still that that does seem to illustrate the point you're making. Yeah. So he clearly had some view of them, either that or he's imagined. Well, like I said, I think it's possible, and so do other people that have looked at the case in depth, mm -hmm. that what he's talking about as ribs could have been those myocomata yeah. muscle yeah. sheets. Yeah. mistaken for ribs but like i said we don't know for sure and we can't go back in a time machine to find out no. now there's the same image but with the body proportions adjusted to what yano measured but it's still got those ribs on it so yeah so let's take a little break if it's all right with you guys mm. let's take a little one yeah. Oh, goodness. Apologies. Sorry, fellas. So there is the picture I was looking for the last time. What you're looking at is a shark carcass that shows strips of myocomata hanging off of the vertebrae that look like short ribs, that look like the ribs described by Yano in his uh, descriptions and drawings. Mm. So it is possible that that's what he saw and mistook for ribs. Now, one other possibility about the body that we need to discuss before we move on is the possibility of it being a turtle. Now, one big problem with the turtle idea is obviously there's no turtle known with a body that elongated. If we take into account the, the um, adjustments made by um, Fujio Yasuda based on uh, Yano's measurements. Now, a normal sea turtle we can go ahead and rule that out because most turtles' bodies are built like a box. In other words, you can't separate the ribs from the belly of the body. It's a, it's a, it's a solid box. The only exception to that rule is the leatherback turtle. Now, let me uh, bring up this image real quick. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. The leatherback turtle That's... obviously doesn't have a normal carapace like most turtles. What it's got is this. You're looking at the back of a leatherback mm -hmm. turtle. It's got a prominent rib cage, and then it's got struts that run along over the top of that. You can see one, two, three, four, five. You know those ridges you see on the back of the mm -hmm. leatherback turtle? Mm -hmm. That's what those are, mm -hmm. those struts. And that is covered in leathery skin and fat. So you can take those struts off, and you've got a rib cage. Hang on. Mm -hmm. So those you can find leatherbacks with those struts missing. 
Okay. So All is right. this carapace, what, what kind of material is it made out of again? It's bone. Those struts. Oh, it is bone. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is look at these, um, look at these pictures at the top. That's what a weatherback skeleton looks like with those struts missing. Mm. I see, I see. See, normally in turtle evolution, to understand the shell of a turtle, what you have to understand is that during the course of their evolution, the rib cage expanded out around the shoulders and the pelvic girdle. So the ribs have stretched out outside the, the, their normal range and have sort of wrapped around the limb girdles. And the ribs have expanded into plates. And that is what you see on a shell. When you look at it, the shell of a normal turtle, you're looking at its rib cage expanded into a box. And that is met around on the bottom with ribs on the bottom too, almost like a plesiosaur. So mm -hmm. basically the rib cage has expanded into a box. Their shoulders and the base of their neck and everything is inside their rib cage. And that's what the shell is. Mm -hmm. The leatherback and the ones like it, like Archelons, <clears throat> those others that were related to it, um, Protostega, have lost a lot of that armor, and it's been made up with by those struts and the leathery skin. So the only possibility of the Ziga Maru being a turtle is something along the lines of a leatherback turtle. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, the, the bottom illustration in these three images that I last sent the body, based on Yano's measurements, is too elongated to be any known turtle. Mm -hmm. And even if you took those struts off, you would still have long ribs like what you see yeah. in the other back. And you don't and see also, that. So to me, that rules out most likely this being any kind of weird turtle. Mm -hmm. so, and 10 that meters doesn't, as well. So that doesn't really... rule out the possibility of it having a turtle-like skull and a turtle-like mm -hmm. neck. Yeah. yeah. So and it could I'd still be to, an unknown reptile that we don't know about. It it could be. I mean, just just to interject really briefly there, it's all with the size. I mean, even Arklon was what four meters maximum length. Uh, this is ten meters. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much yeah. bigger. Uh, yeah. Arklon only got twelve feet long, and the mm -hmm. zoom move carcass was thirty-two feet. Long. So you can do the math yeah. right there. It's way too big to be a turtle, but we know it. Yeah. So if we say that Zuya Maru was an unknown reptile, I'd be much more inclined to the idea of it being some sort of sauropterygian with turtle-like features that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so anyway, now, I mean, that's, that's about as far the case, as you can take that. Isn't it the case that some of the people on board, when it was trawled up, suggested that it might have been a turtle? Yeah, well, they thought it was a turtle with its shell pulled off, but obviously they didn't understand the complexities of turtle anatomy and, and the evolution of turtles mm. and what the shell is itself. You know. See, that's interesting to me because we've talked about the um, – what would you say? The, the experience-oriented credibility of the people on board um, when something like assuming that it was a turtle is – seems to be under this scrutiny of very surface level observation but surely they've trawled up turtles before so that kind of calls into question to some Probably degree not to that extent of decomposition though mm. that's a good point yeah that's a good point that's probably i guess now, how you would imagine it would look as yeah you can see by those two leatherback skeletons there you could theoretically pull up a leatherback with those struts missing and it would look sort of like the Zio Maru, but it wouldn't have the elongated trunk. Mm. Mm. And it wouldn't be as big. But theoretically, you could have a decomposed leatherback turtle 
in a very similar state, but without the elongated body trunk. Mm. It's all academic, you know. Mm. Now the other the other interesting observation is about the back flippers. Now let me bring up the illustration that you very rarely see that Yano did mm. that shows the back flippers. Let me see here. Um, Hold up here. I'm getting there. Let's see, where is it? Um, it reminds me this this turtle conversation we just had about the image that um, you sent me recently, Scott, of the two fishermen who had the who had trawled up the um, the leatherback turtle that was uh, rather elongated looking. Yeah. 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 Well, here, as you can see, this is, um, I traced over uh, Yana's original sketch, and um, Carrick, give me a cleaned up version, and I'll put that in the actual slideshow. Mm. This is um, meant to represent the carcass showing the back flippers. Okay. And some people argued that, well, it probably wasn't a shark because the back flippers which would, if it was a shark or a basking shark, would be the pelvic fins, mm -hmm. were almost the same size as the pectoral fins, and that's not the normal case mm -hmm. even among basking sharks. And as you can see, what Yano has drawn here, they're almost the same size. Now, to answer that criticism, male basking sharks have a set of double penises that are right mm. underneath their pelvic fins, what they call claspers. Mm. Right, now, right. The male, the male basking shark, with those claspers exposed, looks like it has flippers the same size as the uh, pectoral fins. And hang on, I've got several illustrations that will show this. Let me just find them here. Um, Can you see that? Um, yes. Yeah, just a moment. Uh, okay. Huh. It's not I opening. Can't, just a second. Um, I can't see it on my end. Hang on. No, me neither. Oh, no, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. Wait a minute. It's a downloadable file, so it wouldn't pop up in Skype chat no, if you were to open it, but it would yeah. pop up in your downloads, yeah. All right, well, download it. Download it and look at it. Look at it. Yep, right. look at it right now. All right. And I've got other ones. Hang on. Gotcha. Well, you can see that male basking shark has very large pelvic fins. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So... If the Zuyo Maru was a basking shark, it would almost certainly have to be a male one. Mm. And that could possibly answer that anomaly. Right. Yeah. So, let me see here. Where's another picture? Uh, huh. Let me see. Part of the problem is I've got too many pictures to work with. <laughs> and they're all mixed up together. The problem of any true naturalist is too much research. Yeah, well, I'm trying to negotiate the computer and run the Skype and dig for pictures at the same time. Well, anyway, there's another one. You can see what I'm talking about here. Yeah, look at that. So, the last thing we have to discuss yeah. is the tail. Now, if you'll go back up to the image with the two leatherback skeletons, it shows the adjusted skeleton of the Zuyo Maru across the bottom. Mm. You'll see what you've got. We discussed the neck. 
And let's see, they're supposed to, they estimated that there was 14 trunk vertebrae. And what we got here in the illustration, let's see, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tail vertebrae. So it had a fairly long tail. The tail was a little bit longer than the neck. I believe the tail was like six feet long. Hmm. But there's not a whole lot we can do with a tail because if it's missing a caudal fin, there's not a whole lot you can do with that, you know? So right. It could be the tail of a reptile. It could be the tail of a shark. Hmm. You know, yeah. uh, according to what Yano sketched, there were no rays or anything like that on the end of the tail. Now, that could be an indication. If it had had some kind of ray sticking out of the tail, then that, if they were cartilaginous or cartilaginous radials, that would have been an indication that it was a shark. Right. But none of that was there. We don't know if part of the tail was missing or what. So there's mm -hmm. not a whole lot we can do there and just say that, well, it had a tail. So. Yano sketched the, uh, the one that I, I touched up a bit with you, Scott. That one seems to depict the tail kind of curving behind the body, and it, the tail looks really long in that sketch. Yeah. Well, um, were there like any uh, plesiosaurs we know of that had tails that were that like prominent? Well, they had fairly long tails, and we know that they had horizontal, at least some of them had horizontal tail flukes, like a dolphin right. or a whale. Right. We know that Mosasaurs had a shark, somewhat shark-like tail. Some of them did. Mm. With, you know, a um, fish-like tail fin. And so did ichthyosaurs. So right. If it had a tail fin, that would not be an indication of whether it was a shark or a reptile. Yes, right. But if there was internal architecture left from the tail, if it was made out of cartilage that would have been a good indication that it was a shark mm. because sharks have these uh, rays cartilaginous radial elements inside their tails that are sometimes left on these carcasses I got a picture of some of they call them hypochordal and epicordal rays and the difference between those two is that one is in the upper lobe of the tail and the other one is in the lower lobe let me see if I can find that picture. Um, let's see. Mm. Give me a minute here. No problem. Yeah. What are your thoughts on all this so far, Andy? I mean, yeah. Even with most Baskin sharks that you see, those those pelvic fins are, are a fair size anyway mm. um, compared to most sharks, I think. You know, they're, they're rather large. Um, would they have given that appearance? I don't know. Similarly, uh, in a similar vein, I don't think claspers would have looked so large either, or at least mm -hmm. so so um, fin-like, you know, their appearance. They do kind of look like what they described to be as, as you know, two elongates, Penises, <laughs> what about the description? Right, um, right. They would be right. underneath. They would be underneath the uh, pelvic fins. Yeah, yeah. So if they were sitting underneath it and stretched out, you might think it was part of. But then, the I almost feel like somebody like Yano would have picked up on that detail actually, very quickly and noticed. Or oh, actually, hold on, being the mirror. mirror biologist as well it has claspers it, I, I just um well you know but it, what I'm it was saying only on top of that, the ship for an hour so i know mm, but I don't what, I'm, know. what i'm saying on top of that is actually basket sharks do do you know as if they do have rather large pelvic fins they do seem to be a fair size so um could they have been mistaken somehow um, I don't know. For four the whole similarly point is, sized nobody fins. knows. Mm. Yeah. None of us know. We weren't there, and 
we can't go no. back in a time machine. All we have to work with. It's not really clear from the pictures, although they do look to be. In the pictures, they do look to be large. The um the pelvic fins. Um, but they're, they're, again, you know, is this extra skin? Are they peeling off? Are they uh, drooping lower because some of the skin has come away, and that's given them a longer appearance than they they would have had in life. I don't know. Mm. Let's um, let's take a break so I can find this picture. Okay. Sure. All right, so here's the picture showing the um, either hypochordal or epicordal rays. It's hard to tell the way the carcass is oriented. But the hypochordal rays support the upper lobe of the caudal fin, and the epicordal rays support the lower lobe of the caudal fin. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's just about all we can say about the tail but i'm going to use that to seg segue into the next portion i want to talk about here mm -hmm. all right which is the history of how people have been able to identify basking sharks hang on a second here let me see all right Have you heard of the Cherbourg monster? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, this Sorry. happened in Cherbourg or Kirkeville, France, which is essentially the same place. In 1934, this carcass washed up. A lot of people thought it was a whale carcass or some kind of giant seal, an unknown giant seal. Anyway, a French marine biologist named Georges Petit finally identified it from comparing the skull and parts of the backbone with other animals. And the images on the left show the carcass laying on the beach, and the images on the right show Pettit with the skull and part of the backbone. And I'm going to read a section of an article talking about him identifying it. Hang on. I think this is from the Illustrated London News in 1934. Let's see. Okay, here's what it says. It says, sea serpent, monster only sea-worn and nibbled shark. After spending a fortnight in the light of scientific reality, the sea serpent last week sank back into that class of sea beasts that exist only in sailors' minds. The particular sea serpent was, of course, the one which was washed up on the coast of France near Cherbourg. After the water-worn and bird-eaten remains of the 25-foot monster were packed off to Paris, they were examined by the French Museum of Natural History by Professor Petit. His verdict was the monster was simply a basking shark whose remains had been chiseled into a fanciful shape by hungry gulls and herring. The long neck and camelot head were remains of the backbone. Respiratory organs and lower jaw were missing. The furry appearance of the creature was explained by the fact that outer flesh had washed away, leaving a stubble of small bones. This type of shark, a North Atlantic native, is not a man-eater. Growing to as great a length as 40 feet, he lacks to sleep lazily on top of the water, hence his name, Basking Shark. Hmm. So what you're looking at there in the picture, Petit is holding part of the spinal column, which looks like it's either got strips of myokamata or those tail supporting rays hanging off of it. And you can see the cranium and the first part of the cervical vertebrae behind that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very similar to what Everhard Home did with the, with the uh, Stronza Beast. 
he was already working on a uh, the anatomy of basking sharks, and noticed the similarity, and compared the strontiate portions that he was able to examine with portions of basking shark skeletons that he was already studying. And that's another reason why he rejected the um, the extreme length of the Stronza beast was because the uh, portions that he examined in the Stronza beast were roughly the same size as the basking shark things that he was examining. So he thought it had a, maybe a maximum length of something like 36 feet. Hmm. So there's a potential answer to the anomaly of why the the Stronza beast was allegedly so large. Now, right. the Stronza beast evidence was re-examined again in 1978 by a Scottish marine biologist named Jeff Swinney. And he also compared the remains of the Scapa flow car car carcass, uh, mm -hmm. so-called Scaposaurus, with basket charts, and he wrote a paper on it in 1978. So let me bring that up. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, this is from the Journal of Natural History, 1978. Basking shark, genera Halcidrus nil and Scaposaurus marwick as synonyms of Cedarites Blainville by K.P. Bland and G.N. Swinney. Hmm. In September 1808, the carcass of an animal was washed ashore in Stronce in the Orkneys. On 19th November 1808, details of this great snake were reported to the Bornerian Natural History Society of Edinburgh by Patrick Neal, the secretary. A more detailed account of the animal was presented at the next meeting of the Society on January 14th, 1809, when Dr. Barclay com communicated some highly curious observations that he had made on the coal vertebrae of the great sea snake, etc. And Mr. P. Neal read a copious and interesting general account of the new animal. He submitted it to the Society the outline of a generic character. The name which he suggested for this new genus was Halcidrus, from Hal's the Sea, the Hydros, a water snake. He suggested that the specific name might, with propriety, be Halcidrus pontopidani. The above report links the generic name Halcidrus with the vertebrae described by Dr. John Barclay. Barclay later published his observations in the Society's Memoirs in 1811. His article also contained a colored plate of the skull and petrol girdle of the animal, but he gave no description of these. The vertebrae described by Bar Barclay were then in the Museum of the University of Edinburgh. Material from this museum later formed the basis of the natural history collections of the Royal Scottish Museum, and three of these vertebrae are still present in the collections. Comparison of these vertebrae with unequivocal material in the British Museum confirmed the findings of Home in 1809 that they belonged to Cedarinus maximus, the basking shark. Hence, Halcidrus pontopidani is a synonym of Cedarinus maximus. Another animal washed ashore in Orkney deserves mention. In December 1941, a carcass on the shore of Scapa Flow led to much speculation, and subsequently, Mr. J.G. Marwick named the animal Scaposaurus. A single vertebrae from this animal, preserved in the British Museum London, confirms that this animal was also a basking shark. So here again, we've got comparison a basking shark vertebrae with vertebrae from both the Scaposaurus animal and the Stronza beast, which seems to confirm that both of those animals were also mutilated basking sharks. So for a long time, up until molecular <clears throat> biochemistry came along, 
that was about the only way that you could confirm that these carcasses were mutilated basking sharks was by comparative anatomy. And as we can see, by the 70s, they were able to do biochemistry work on elastoidin, which pointed in that direction as well. So the state of the Zero Maru carcass, we, they were working from comparative anatomy and the limited ability from biochemistry, comparative biochemistry at, at the state it was in in 1978, which also pointed toward the Zia Maru being probably a basking shark. Anyway, but the techniques that we have now are vastly superior. Let me move on to some of those. Okay, let's hmm. see. Okay, they have a thing now which they call the gen bank. And what the gen bank is, mm. it's the DNA sequences of different marine animals, the complete DNA strand awesome. digitized. Wow. And what you can do now is you can take a DNA sequence that you get of an unidentified carcass and check it against the data in the gen bank and see if there's a match, and if there's a match, that tells you what this animal is. Hmm. Okay, let me uh, find the paper that I'm looking for here. Um, all right, hang on. I think this is it. Yes. This is from a marine biology journal, a very well-known called the Biological Bulletin. From February 2002, how to tell a sea monster, molecular discrimination of large marine animals of the North Atlantic by SM Carr et al. Hmm. Abstract, remains of large marine animals that wash ashore can be difficult to identify Due to decomposition and loss of external body parts, and in consequence may be dubbed sea monsters. DNA that survives in such creatures can provide a basis of identification. One such creature washed ashore at St. Bernard's Fortune Bay, Newfoundland in August 2001. DNA was extracted from the carcass and enzymatically enzymatically amplified by the polymerase chain reaction PCR, the mitochondrial NADH2 DNA sequence was identified as that of a sperm whale, Physeter catadine. Amplification and sequencing of cryptozoological DNA with universal PCR primers with broad specificity to vertebrate taxa and comparison with comparison with species in the GenBank taxonomic database is an effective means of discriminating otherwise unidentifiable large marine creatures. When anatomical identification is not possible and DNA can be recovered, effective identification of unknown marine creatures begins with PCR amplification with universal primers designed to be homologous to gene regions that are evolutionally conserved across a diversity of taxa. The resultant DNA sequence can then be compared against the complete GenBank database of the National Center for Biotechnology Information by means of a blast search. This involves a simple cut and paste submission of the sequence data over the internet. An answer is usually obtained within minutes here in under 30 seconds. The search returns a set of matches ranked in order of degree of sequence similarity. In this case, an essentially exact match was obtained, which indicates a positive species identification. Now, the two images on the slide I just sent you, the top one is the Fortune Bay carcass which turned out to be a sperm whale based on the DNA. 
Mm. The bottom image is a basking shark from Japan. And you okay. can see you can see how similar looking they are. They're just blobs of flesh. So sometimes the resemblance is so startling that, that the only way they have to identify these things are molecular. Because you just look at them and you can't really tell. Yeah. yeah. Now, this, this blast search that I mentioned is clarified in the paper about the Parker's Cove monster. So let me bring that back up real quick, and I'll explain what a blast search is. Hang on. Let me see. Uh... This is from uh, CEN Technical Journal 2005. Oh, uh, yeah. You see the slide there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, this carcass washed up in Parker's Cove, Newfoundland in 2010. And this is quotes from a paper called Parky, a new pseudoplesiosaur washed up on the Nova Scotia coast by Pierre Jolstrom and Henry DeRus. A pseudoplesiosaur carcass found on the Nova Scotia coast was thoroughly studied. Its major external and internal features were examined and photographed, and some tissue samples were further analyzed in the laboratory. The carcass was clearly identified as that of a basking shark. Hmm. This study helped to establish characteristic features of basking shark decomposition that should be used in identifying these huge creatures that are per periodically washed up on coastlines around the world. DNA sequencing. If Parky was indeed a basking shark, this would be confirmed by its DNA. Professor Herman and Dr. Don Stewart from Acadia University obtained a tissue sample from Parky, from which they abstract extracted some DNA and carried out PCR Polymerase chain reaction analysis using some basking shark specific DNA primers BC, BSC YTHF2 and BSC YTHR1. The primers have been developed by a UK laboratory to help check for basking shark products and deriv derivatives in commercial products because of concerns of a worldwide decline in basking shark numbers. Mm. These primers have been shown to have a high specificity for basking shark DNA as they need to stand up to legal scrutiny. The primers are based on Cedaronis maximus basking shark cytochrome B gene and mitochondrial gene which encodes mitochondrial protein. According to the strategy if, strategy, if the PCR results proved to be negative, this would mean that Parky was not a basking shark, and further analysis would need to be carried out to try to identify what type of creature it was. According to Herman, when tested, the samples were consistently and unequivocally positive. The DNA amplified very strongly, indicating a match with basking shark. There is now little doubt in my mind, based on the DNA evidence, that Parkey was indeed a basking shark. In order to double check that the amplified DNA fragment did indeed correspond to cytochrome B gene, its DNA sequence was analyzed. The sequence procedure was able to resolve 148 out of the 186 bases, 80% of the amplified fragment. A blast search, basic local alignment search tool, a method for rapid searching of nucleotide and protein databases, with this sequence most closely matched that of basking shark cytochrome B gene with 146 matching bases out of 148, i.e. 99% similarity. It was also interesting to note that the seven most similar sequences in the blast search were cytochrome B genes from other sharks, i.e. sequences from 123 down to 119 bases in length, 
with 89 to 87 percent identity such as longfin mako great white and big eye thresher shark the pcr analysis therefore unequivocally confirms a basking shark identity for parky so now they can use specific primers from um, different basking sharks um, or from different basking shark genes to even identify basking shark elastoid from a bowl of soup. Wow. Now, if they can do that, I would imagine if they've got an actual complete fiber from the Zia Maru carcass, they would probably, even though it's been possibly degraded for 40 years, would still be able to get some kind of usable DNA sequence out of it. So if this um, fiber still exists at the uh, university, let me bring that up again, um, we might be able to solve this mystery. Let's see. At Shizuoka University, this is from 1996. Yeah. This is from Katsumi Abe. The Japanese plesiosaur was collected 30 miles off Christchurch on the morning of April 25th, 1977. It was reported after three months later when the fishing boat returned to Japan. The crew discarded it because of the terrible smell of decaying. We only have a few photos of the nearly whole body, it looks like a plesiosaur indeed, and a single bristle, I don't know the proper term, from the fin. Later, a scientist reported biochemical similarity to a certain shark based on the composition ratio of amino acids in the bristle. And this was written by Katsumi Abe, Shizuoka University Life and Earth Sciences. And he was killed in a car wreck in 1998. So. I don't know. Shame. I've tried to contact Shizuoka University to find out if the fiber is still there. I'm guessing it most likely still is. Mm. But, you know, that's all we got to work with, to my knowledge. I would that's imagine the only that, one, yeah. That's the only one of these fibers that may still be in existence. And the most recent information we have on it is 25 years old. In fact, this month. It's dated March 5th. 1996, so that's 25 years ago, mm. to the month. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's um, it would be fantastic if it was still there. We could get some word of it. Then I have been yeah. trying to reach them for over a week, with two weeks now, I think. Yeah, uh, but no luck. No luck as yet. Yeah. Okay, so to kind of wrap this up, I'm going to look at three recent techniques used to identify basking shark products using specific DNA primers from different genes. This is from 2007 uh, from a journal called Animal Conservation, Genetic Tracking of Basking Shark Products an international trade by J.E. Magnuson et al. Mounting evidence that sharks are being overfished to supply shark fin markets is causing widespread concern about the sustainability of these practices. The basking shark, Cedaronis maximus, whose fins command high market prices, has proven especially sensitive to exploitation. To prevent further population declines, the species is now protected in the territorial waters of several countries and is listed on Appendix 2 of the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species sites requiring monitoring of trade and its products by all parties to sites. Tracking trade in basking shark products, however, is often hampered by difficulties in identifying shark products to species of origin. Here we present the development and application of a streamlined 
genetics forensics assay that does not require DNA sequencing to identify basking shark products. The dual primer species specific polymerase chain reaction strategy provides diagnostic redundancy for robustness in legal venues. It is also effective for identifying basking shark products regardless of geographic origin and important consideration given the global dis distribution of the species and international sourcing of fins to the trade. Application of this assay confirmed the presence of basking shark fins in the Hong Kong and Japan markets and indicated an apparent relationship between the Chinese fin trader Nuo Wei Tuan Jin and fins from basking sharks. The assay was also used in a law enforcement investigation to document illegal trade in basking shark fins in the United States where this species is prohibited from harvest and trade. These trade detections suggest the high market value of basking shark fins is continuing to drive the exploitation, surreptitious and otherwise, of this highly threatened species, underscoring the need for improved trade monitoring. The streamlined assay developed here can assist in monitoring and conservation on a worldwide scale. To assist in DNA-based identification of basking shark products, Holzel 2001 published a forensic assay that was based on DNA sequencing using a species-specific primer from the mitochondrial cytochrome B gene. Because of the dependence of this test on DNA sequencing and the need for rapid cost-effective assay methods for high-volume screening and increasingly widespread international regulatory regimes, we have extended this species-specific primer approach to eliminate the need for sequencing. Here, we report the development and extensive diagnostic validation of two basking shark-specific PCR primers derived from the nuclear ribosomal internal transcribed spacer 2, ITS2 locus. We subsequently applied these primers in a streamlined multiplex PCR electrophoretic assay to investigate the international shark fin trade and assist U.S. law enforcement activities. Okay, now this other one. Is from 2014. Are you familiar with the open access journal PLOS1? I am not actually. Well, anyway, it's an same. open access online journal. This was published on there. It's an article called A Novel Mini DNA Barcoding Assay to Identify Processed Fins from Internationally Protected Shark Species by Andrew T. Fields et al. Now, this is talking about DNA directly from elastoid, which is right up the alley of what we're talking about here with that possible fiber left over at Shizuoka University. Mm -hmm. Now, this says there is a growing need to identify basking shark products in trade, in part due to the recent listing of five commercially important species on the appendices of the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Sites: the poor beagle, Lemnonassis, oceanic white tip, Crocaridon longimanus, scalloped hammerheads, Sperna lewini, smooth hammerhead, Sperna cygana, and great hammerhead, S. mocani, in addition to three species listed in the early part of the century. The whale shark, Rincodon typus, the basking shark, Cedarinus maximus and the white shark, Carcaridon carcarius. Shark fins are traded internationally to supply the Asian dried seafood market in which they are used to make the luxury dish shark fin soup. Shark fins usually enter international trade with their skin still intact and can be identified using morphological characters or standard DNA barcoding approaches. Once they reach Asia and are traded in this region, the skin is removed and they are treated with chemicals that eliminate many key diagnostic characters and degrade their DNA. Here we present a validated mini barcode assay based on partial 
sequences of the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene that can reliably identify the process fans of seven of the eight sites listed shark species. We also demonstrate that the assay can be frequently can frequently identify the species or genus of shark of shark fin soup. 31 out of 50 samples. So, given the fact that they can identify <clears throat> to the species from from elastoidin in a bowl of soup, I would think that even due to the fact that uh, the zeom root fiber, if it still exists, may have been chemically treated and been sitting around degrading for 40 years, they might still be able to get a usable DNA sequence out of it. I don't know. We'll never know unless we try. So bringing this up to the present, this is a paper from Nature from 2020. It's called Rapid Detection of Sites Listed Shark Fin Species by Loop-Mediated Isothermal Amplification Assay with Potential for Field Use by Grace Wing Chu Butte et al. Shark fin is a delicacy in many Asian countries. Over-exploitation of sharks for shark fin trading has led to a drastic reduction in shark population. To monitor international trade of shark fin products and protect the endangered species from further population decline, we present rapid user-friendly and sensitive diagnostic loop-mediated isothermal amplification, LAMP, and effective polymerase chain reaction PCR assays for 12 sites-listed shark species. Species-specific LAMP and PCR primers were designed based on cytochrome oxidase 1 and NADH2 regions. Our LAMP and PCR assays have been tested on 291 samples from 93 sharks and related species. Target shark species could be differentiated from non-target species within three hours from DNA extraction to LAMP assay. Mm. The LAMP assay reported here is a simple and robust solution for on-site detection of sites listed shark species with shark fin products. So there you go. So the molecular techniques are getting better and better as we move into the future. Hmm. So that's from last year, that's state of the art. So we're almost at the end here and we need to summarize why the situation regarding analysis of the Zia Maru carcass is so polarized. Mm. With one group of people on the creation side generally yelling it was a plesiosaur, and the other side yelling, well, it was proven to be a basking shark. Mm. Now, the basking shark claim is closer to the truth, but that's not exactly the entire truth either. Right. So, I believe, look, having looked at this whole controversy for the last 25 years, my opinion is that the media is partly to blame. And the reason why is it was a big story when the story initially broke. <clears throat> and it was in all the papers up until the point where they did the first biochemical comparison of the fibers with the blue shark and said that, well, it resembles the fibers found in a blue shark. And then it drops out of the newspapers for whatever reason. So we know from the scientific papers that they had two conferences of scientists at the Tokyo University of Fisheries, two meetings, and a set of papers were written out of those two meetings which are generally considered to be the final word on the analysis of the Zia Maru case. Now, the general consensus among most of the scientists, when those papers were published in July 1978, that it was most likely the mutilated carcass of a basking shark. However, despite all that, there were a few holdouts that made rational arguments against the idea 
of it being a basking shark mm. that had absolutely nothing to do with creation, young earth creation beliefs or any of that. That's in the final papers from 1978. And people that have said that it was proven to be a basking shark kind of want to brush all that stuff up under the rug, and that's not an accurate reflection of the truth. Hmm. You know? So part of what happened was, in my opinion, is that the media dropped the ball and didn't follow up on the results from the 1978 papers. They did report the opinions of various experts at the time that some were saying that, oh, you know, there's a whole history of carcasses washed up like this, and they always turn out to be basking shark carcasses or mutilated whales, which is essentially true. So you can't, you know, if you look at the Ziomaru carcass by itself, you know, you're not getting the full picture. You have to look at it in the context of the history of plesiosaur-looking carcasses that have washed up various places around the world that turned out to be basking sharks. That's very important. The media kind of dropped the ball on that. There's some of that in the scientific papers, but not enough. So, in January, or no, June of 1978, in the Journal of Creation, there was an article published about the Zia Maruk case, you know, about, well, what's the story on this? What was the final word on this? And this kind of crossed in the mail with the scientific papers. The paper, the creation paper, was submitted in January 1978, but not published until June 1978. The scientific papers did not come out until July 1978. So, the fact that the, the newspapers did not report the final results from the scientific papers kind of buried that news outside of people that were directly involved or people that were following the case outside of the news media. Mm. So, you know, eventually this led, in 1991 there was a paper published in the journal Creation, saying that there was a cover-up. And <clears throat> there wasn't a cover-up. It's just that the media neglected to follow up on the results from 1978. Mm. They were out there, but it was just, you know, it was outside of biological circles. It was not common knowledge. So, as a result of that, various creation um, political evangelical ar ar uh, arguers, I guess you'd call them, went with the initial news reports and played up the fact that these Japanese biologists who were working just with the pictures before the biochemical analysis, we're playing up the plesiosaur idea. So they ran with this and distorted it and said, yeah, these Japanese scientists said it was a plesiosaur, which is true up to a point. And you even had Shikama after the initial test with the blue shark saying, well, that doesn't prove that it wasn't a plesiosaur, which is true. Mm -hmm. But the main point here is that in the final papers from 1978, you had two biologists saying at the end of the day that we're not sure if this is a shark or possibly an undescribed reptile, which is very important. Mm. So this is from, you know, after all the scientific analysis, you had a couple of holdouts that saying, well, it could have been a reptile. And then you had Yasuda, based on the measurements, that Yano had made saying that the measurements of the body proportions did not match up with any known fish or any kind of shark. Now, that's the minority opinion, but it, nevertheless, these are informed opinions by qualified biologists 
saying this stuff. Now, you know, obviously, for people who are against the idea of there being relic plesiosaurs or something like that alive in the oceans now, or possibly even in freshwater lakes, you know, this is problematic because looking at the history of sea serpents and lake monsters and the vast amount of eyewitness testimonial evidence, photographic evidence and all that other stuff, the only thing missing to confirm that stuff is a dead body. So, if you're trying to hammer home the fact that plesiosaurs have been extinct for 66 million years, even the possibility of something like this is a problem. And if you're given a situation where most of the evidence points to it being a shark, and a known type of shark that has a history of deteriorating in such a way that it resembles a plesiosaur, then obviously you're going to find that option much more attractive. Rather than dealing with the other side of the argument, which is extremely problematic. So, the people that are inclined to say that, well, it was proven to be a basking shark, want to tend to brush all that other evidence up under the rug. And that's not an accurate reflection of the whole truth. So basically, when people ask me, what was the Zia Maru carcass? I say that, well, most of the evidence points toward it being a mutilated basking shark. However, there was some minority opinion that questioned that based on some real evidence. It might have been soft evidence, but nevertheless, it was evidence. And if you dig further afield and look into advances in knowledge about the biology of fossil marine reptiles that have come to light since 1978, you realize that many of the features that were pointed to as it being, as being proving it to be a shark are ambiguous. And there are other pieces of evidence that need to be considered that weren't around in 1978. And even the biochemical stuff, you know, uh, I mean, I think I've shown that um, that we see that based on the available biochemistry evidence in 1978, the most that that could tell you was that it was a shark based on the biochemical analysis. And then from 1982, you have a paper that briefly mentions the possibility of the last story in reptiles. So just looking at that stuff, you know, you can even question the biochemical analysis. So, mm. that's, you know, and people on the other side of the argument have made mistakes, too. I know Adam Smith, the plesiosaur specialist, 20 years ago on his website, he had a section about the Zia Maru carcass, and he made the erroneous statement that DNA in 1978 proved it to be a basking shark. Now, he's since fixed it since then. But this just goes to show you that some of the arguments used by the pro-shark people are sometimes an error as well. Mm. So basically the fact that this got dragged into the creation evolution debate, and as polarizing as that is, the, the fact that the evolutionists, or the, the creationists ran with this evidence and distorted it has polarized the other side and made looking at the Zia Maru carcass as anything other than a mutilated basking shark radioactive, if you follow me. Right. So that's pretty much well a summary of you know the situation. So so what are your last what are your final thoughts on this? Well I think absolutely that there's the biggest thing that this case suffers from is straw manning because there is such from both the media and from a lot of 
investigators a, a lack of attention to minute details that really muddies the water on what exactly this case actually was. And I think that that's scientifically really kind of shameful because you're supposed to leave no stone unturned. And the reason for that is because every unturned stone is another margin for error. And if you have too many of those, you're reaching a premature conclusion. It doesn't mean that your conclusion is necessarily wrong, because like you've mentioned, most of the evidence that is roughly definitive points to Basking Shark. But there's also some counter evidence that's pretty compelling, like the biochemical analysis where the, uh, the radioactive analysis only 70 to 75 percent matched with Basking Shark, which is still a pretty big majority. Yeah. But it's not 100 percent. It's not even 90 percent. It's 75 percent. It's three fourths as much as a Basking Shark, which is actually a pretty big margin of error, especially in a time when DNA science hadn't been perfected yet. So. Yeah. The issue that I'm running into with that, and that I think everyone should run into with that, because if we're going to approach this scientifically, this is the issue. Even if something is extremely likely, it needs to be shown beyond a reasonable doubt, and there's at least one or two reasonable doubts in this case to have. Yeah. Especially considering all of the anatomical analysis that we've done here, you can't yeah. really rely on the anatomical observations, either because they're just not specific enough or because the things that are specific enough actually happen to match up pretty well with most large marine species and are very unspecific so well when the you bottom have a case line is that if there's any of these fibers left from 1977 with today's molecular dna technology we have a shot at finally answering the question if we can mm. just find it yeah, and that, that I think will lead us good into what Andy has to say, because Andy, you've been looking into trying to see if we can get a hold of those fibers, or if someone can, at least. I have, I have. I've, I've tried various numbers for, oh gosh, several weeks, and I've got a brand new one to try tonight at about 12, which would be 9 o'clock their time in Shizuoka, Japan. And I, I do hope to find it. Just as a, you know, a comment on, on the perspectives, I think that Scott mentioned that tainted this from the beginning and and sharing with those perspectives myself you know what i've found through my short journey here in into cryptozoology is that nearly all of it and science itself is dominated by personal philosophy and on the one hand we think we have science on the other hand we think we have religious philosophy or, or uh, personal philosophy whether that be a belief in the paranormal or, or other and i think Scott really nailed it there when he said that people's, people's investigation into this subject was based upon what they wanted to get out of it. And so I think the, you know, the, just call them the materialist, for want of a better word, um, seeing the interest of the, of the creationists, didn't want the other team to score a point and therefore maybe didn't look into it as far as they, they could have or, or at least return to examine the evidence the way that Scott's done in this talk. And the creationists desperate to get that point, which they thought would, you know, would prove uh, creation that, that still, you know, living for one of a better word, dinosaurs. I know plesiosaurs are dinosaurs, but something from that period uh, also, you know, jumped onto this far too quickly. Now I know most creationist circles don't consider this to be a plesiosaur anymore, and they they think it's a bas uh, basking shark. I I just think. An examination of the physical evidence again, of course, would be would be well, fantastic. We still I, have. I we still have given, the. Um, I feel we've given as accurate a picture of the situation as is possible with yeah. this discussion. So. Absolutely, but I mean the the physical uh, the the remaining physical samples if they can be found, and um, you know we still have the testimony of Misha Hikoyano. We still have the sketches. Yep. He was he was a professional person. He was an experienced person. The, the the crew were experienced. They were professional fishermen and trawlermen, and many of the scientists who believed it could have been um, a, a reptile of some kind, or at least not a basking shark, were also you know um, experts in the field, or at least in their fields. And I think that's that's still worth something that's still worth something in, in what we're looking at of course wow. there were just as many eminent people who said the opposite and the the test that came back you know, a story in 
they were as conclusive as they could be then in, in terms of saying this is this is from a, a shark or very, at least very similar to the, the blue shark. Well, there's shark also the see. option it could be an unknown shark we don't know about. Yes. Yeah. And if it yeah. is, it's 32 feet long, so that would be an astounding yeah. discovery in its, in its own right. So, I don't know. For me, for both of you, for me, the clincher is still, and it was when you showed the the uh, picture of the, the pectoral girdle, or appeared to be the pectoral girdle. And yeah. it just seemed to me then I could I could imagine with with the what appeared to be the neck and head on the carcass, I could then imagine the rest of the I don't know what the technical term for, for that is, but the, the jaw, the lower jaw and the end of the torso matching up and filling that yeah. space at the oh. bottom of the girdle yeah. to make the shark head. And from that moment actually, I haven't been able to escape that image. And well, um, you know, it's yeah. the- the, the shark people have very powerful arguments mm, on their side. So. I've never denied that. You know? yeah, I think so. Well, we've run out of time, so. Wow, well, this has been an adventure, and thank you guys well, for helping yes. us. Thank you so Absolutely. much, Scott and Carrie. Yeah, so. That's that. Awesome. Awesome. What, what, a, what a ride. Thank you so much. Mm.